This is iFanboy Pick of the Week, number 874, brought to you by iFanboy listeners just like you. Hey, my name is Josh Flanagan, and I have no co-host this week. It is just me. I'm doing the show on my own because Connor is currently on the run from the cartel. Which cartel? I don't know. I don't. I barely understand what a cartel is. But every once in a while, I'd say like once a year or so, I think, oh, I'll just do a show by myself. And, and then when I'm about to start it, uh, I think this was a terrible idea. And I put it off, and, and I do it really late, and, and here we are. Uh, this, however, will still remain iFanboy Pick of the Week number 874. Every week, one of us, usually there's myself and uh, Connor Kilpatrick, who is, uh, as I said, he's on the run. He's on the lam. Uh, he, uh, we will pick the comic that they like best of the week from all the stack that came out on that given Tuesday slash Wednesday, whatever happens now. That comic book is called The Pick of the Week. We will talk about the book. I'm going to say we, but I, it's just me. It's just well, We'll talk about that book, the other books from the week. Uh, I'm going to deal with the patron pick on my own. I even have some uh, listener mail, I think. And I mean, if I don't have time, it's my fault. I have no one to blame, just me. There will be spoilers for the books. You can exercise some caution. But the good news is we are out uh, from under the fascistic uh, yoke of one Conor Kilpatrick, a man so regimented, a man so fully ruled by his his need to instill order and 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 patterns uh, and, and in everything he and other people do that it, it's frankly it's stifling, uh, like like having a rhinoceros stand on your chest. And I, for one, I I don't I don't need him to come back. I think it's totally totally fine. I think he listens to these. I'm fairly certain he listens to these. All right, so let let, let me get on with it. Uh, how's everybody doing? You guys doing okay? I have no one to uh, I have no one to banter off. But here's what I'll tell you, because you know, here we are. It's just you and me. Uh, I'm currently recovering from diverticulitis. There you go. I've told you something. About me. I've been uh, <laughs> I've been uh, a personal uh, connection there. Uh, it hurt. Uh, it doesn't hurt as much anymore. Uh, it did suck though. So, uh, I don't know why I told you that. I need to say something. Pick of the Week is Ambassadors number two. This is the a new series from Mark Miller. Uh, last issue was also Pick of the Week, and I think it was the patron pick as well. Uh, the artist on the last book was Frank Quitely, and every issue, I believe, they're putting somebody else in here. And this week, it is Carl Kershaw on art. Uh, great, great artist. A veteran. Been around for a good long time. And colors by a name... Uh, that I have never never seen or said out loud, but here we go. It's Michelle uh, Asaras. Nope, Asarasacorn. Asarasacorn. Michelle Asarasacorn. I swear that seems to be correct. And letters by Clem Robbins. Clem Robbins, who uh, he lettered a lot of the Vertigo stuff in the '90s, uh, notably Preacher. And I said something nice about him once on a show or we did a post and he wrote in like thank god somebody saying nice about lettering something nice about lettering and i was like you need to listen more often because uh, we like letters a lot but uh he's a good letter is my point all right so why is this pick of the week i don't know you tell me i don't really have a great idea about that i think the idea here is that the idea of this story is that a rich smart person has decide has come up with a way to give people superpowers um, and, and the idea is that in order to get them, you must be a really, really, really good person. And, uh, so everybody wants superpowers and are petitioning for it, but obviously most people are not really good people. And our story here, uh, is about, um, I, I can't remember his name. That's not surprising. Anybody who listens to this show as a couple of men, they're in Delhi, India, and the one, they work at a phone store together. And the one has a big crush on, uh, on a woman named Gita. And uh, there is a terrorist attack or some sort of shooting at the mall, and they take the girl that he has a crush on hostage. And he says, no, no, don't take her, take me. And then they shoot him in the head. Um, But when he wakes up, it turns out that he's been saved and that his very good deed uh, is is been rewarded by him having superheroes, and then he becomes Codename India, 
And the idea is that everybody from each country, uh, there's a superhero from every country, and he's codename India. That's the best name. There's some jokes about how that's the best thing that they could come up with, even though they recognize that it's uh, it's it's not that great. By the way, his name is Binu, I think. I don't know how to say that exactly, but um, and I think what got me here really had to do more with execution than anything else. Um, it is, you know, I don't know that there is a better superhero guy, superhero, the big S, than Mark Miller. And so now, I don't know that there's a better superhero guy. A person who just genuinely loves superheroes and comics and stuff, and he's gone back to that well over and over and over again over the years. You know, you could say like, oh, uh, Mark Wade is is like the best in continuity superhero guy, or Jeff Johns is the best DC superhero guy, or you know, like that. But like, just superhero guy, it's got to be Mark Miller, or or at least he's up there. And as I'm starting to talk about this, I, I'm I'm kind of having a hard time coming up with an a, a good explanation for why this is pick of the week. Except I know the fact that I, I read a bunch of books and I had several finalists i guess and there was always like this this is pretty good this this was all right this is pretty good but nothing that i was like i loved but when i came down to it like i had enjoyed this book the most partially because i didn't expect much of it i almost forgot that it existed but it just read really smoothly and fun and it ended and i wanted to know what came next <laughs> Carl Kershaw is a is a great and I, I think underappreciated comic book artist. I you know I feel like I came across him for the first time in the '90s. I want to say it was on something like Flash because uh, he's sort of a fun cartoony kind of style. But so far, we're very used to a genius, rich, wonderful person comes up with something uh, and is going to give it away for the good of humanity, and you think there's going to be a sort of a shoe dropping there. But so far, that doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, this Korean woman who does it like she she's genuinely seems committed, but realistically so to this superhero program she's got going on. And I don't know the setup like there's nothing about this that is particularly original, it, like at all, but it works really well. I don't know if that's like it's like this is the best meatloaf you've ever tried, um, but sort of all the bits of it that go together were really compelling. I liked. I think the way that they brought in the realistic uh, need for explanation of something. So, for example, um, oh, he's got he's got a crush on this girl, and uh, you know he did this thing for her, which was selfless, but also kind of not. And he's not sure how he feels about that. Uh, he can't tell his family about it, and they have to uh, give give his family like a cover cover story for what he's doing. And he gets from after he becomes a superhero and becomes world famous. And there's also a line in here about how like these people will be the most famous people in the entire you know history of the world, and and a, and a really good explanation for how that is and why it works. And I just thought that's really just smart. There's just all these sort of smart ideas. Nothing is crazy out there. Like, I've never seen this before. It's just, like, super skilled. And uh, I really enjoyed it for that. And, you know, it's it's good Mark Miller is fantastic. It is – there's no one who just kind of – I mean, I think he's close to Mark Wade. I know I said that name before, but, like, they can just do this thing. These superhero comic books, they do them really well. And uh, he skips a lot of the stuff that, like, it's the second issue. It's the first time we meet this guy who's, you know, the uh, codename India. And you know, he is a page or so. He's trying to work out his powers. Then he kind of gets it. And he's fine. And then he becomes a superhero, which is kind of cool. Like, he jumps off a satellite into the Earth's atmosphere. We don't waste a lot of time on that. We get right to the fun parts. Um, and Kershaw completely... Um, compliments that i guess uh there's code name mexico who walks in and uh he's he's smoking weed which i was like that's a little that's a little stereotypical i don't know if that's okay but uh luckily i don't have to deal with the fallout of putting stereotypes of uh <laughs> of nationalities in my comic books so it's just fine i'm not gonna justify this for a really long time i thought it was a fun book i thought it was it was it was great the last issue was good i like this one even better it gives me a shape to what it is and that's how i got to be pick of the week 
All right, there we go. You know it was almost pick of the week. And if you've been listening to the show, you are going to understand that I like the Wildcats for reasons I can't fully explain. And I keep trying to read the new ones. And uh, I'm always like, I don't know if that's very good. And then I don't stop reading it. And then over time, I come to like it. We have Wildcats number six from our friend Matthew Rosenberg. And when I say our friend, I mean, just mean I've done an interview with him and I know him kind of. Uh, but that never has anything to do with if you make good or bad comic books. You got to make good comic books to get talked about on here. But if you want to listen to the Talksplode that I did with Matthew Rosenberg, it is over at ifanboy.com. And you should because it's really interesting. He's a great writer. And he has been the guy who has been helming Wildcats for some time. Kind of, kind of in the sort of post DC merger world, he's been the guy who got who got to sort of steer the Wildcats, and this is another version of that. I, I know, I know, I've talked about this a lot, but it really was almost my pick of the week because I think this was one of the issues that like gelled everybody together as we sort of see who the bad guy is. It's the same bad guy that it always is uh, <laughs> in, in in Wildcats books, but it took a little while to get there. There was. Really wonderful Clark Kent Superman in this. And I know that my erstwhile partner, who is, again, on the run from the law, <laughs> he he doesn't like the mixture of DC uh, into this. And it totally makes sense why he wouldn't. But there is uh, there's good Superman here. And I, and I, I kind of like that he functions. He, does, he literally functions in this as a journalist. But he also functions as a sort of observer to this world because he is, you know, he's the real superhero. Uh, in the world but uh, so he goes to a diner and he's trying to learn more about these these wildcats folks I don't think anybody actually calls them that Batman pops out of the bushes and says uh, we need to talk and and he says how, how did you find me and then Batman was like I just checked all the places that claim they, they, they I just, did you hear my slight Batman voice I just checked all the places places that claim to serve the best apple pie so he does all that cross check and he figures out where uh, Superman because he loves apple pie and then Batman steals some of his fries this was the single finest Batman Superman page I've seen in some some time we're talking about this collection of characters um, where you have uh, is it is it Maxine Manchester the, the punk rock robot lady and uh, Spartan who is sort of the Superman but he's a robot he had a great fight with Superman last time in one of the other issues where where he was like I'm a big fan and then he would punch him uh, Grifter comes up like the team is formed it's six issues in and now we kind of know where we stand and it's this long form superhero storytelling that I've, only, I've read really good Wildcats books, and I kind of just expect something out. I think that's it. I don't think I like the Wildcats as much as I like that I've read a lot of great Wildcat stories over history from between Joe Casey and Alan Moore and others. Uh, Warren Ellis just did that one. Uh, that was about Michael Cray, whose superhero code name is Death Blow, which is a Seinfeld movie, like one of those fake movies. I love Seinfeld movie titles, by the way. I can't think of any of the other ones right now. This is why I need to have Connor on here, because I can't remember. This is Death Blow. This is, of course, the Rochelle Rochelle. <laughs> One Girl's Strange Erotic Journey from Alanda Minsk. Uh, <laughs> and I'm just going to start talking about TV shows I like. Um, fun issue. It really was almost pick of the week. Uh, I, 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 They've got the personalities of the characters right they have to keep shoehorning them in the dc but when you can it works out really well guardians of the galaxy number one from marvel comics obviously uh we have a new uh, a new series a rebooting i don't remember where it left off i feel like all of them died or something like that i'm not sure colin kelly and jackson lansing um who are hit and miss with me I think Connor and I have both finally jumped ship on that Captain America series, but they were also responsible for that wonderful Kang miniseries a ways back, and I think everything else sort of exists between there. This is a Western. It's a, it's a straight-up Western. Uh, Peter Quill approaches on a, not a horse, sort of like a purple dragon tauntaun kind of thing, a little velociraptor or whatever, and he goes into town, and nobody wants to hear from him. And then, you know, the, the locals are all like, get out of here. And he's like, something bad's coming. And then the others show up. And then Gamora shows up in this weird garter belt kind of Old West suit. It's, it's a weird choice. And, and then Mantis does a, 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 like a sexy uh, show for the folks uh, in town. And they like her a lot. 
And basically, they have to evacuate everybody out of the town. Nobody wants to go, blah, blah, blah. And they keep, they're saying, oh, no, it's coming. It's coming. The fall is coming. You guys, the fall is coming. And it's very uh, impending and serious. It's going to destroy the whole planet. And so they got to convince the people to go and save them. And the fall, it's a Groot fall. So there's a giant, flaming, angry Groot head. I don't know what happened. I don't know if anybody knows what happened. But that's the thing uh, that is coming. I really... I really dug this actually quite a lot. I only bought it uh, initially, only read it because Kev Walker was the artist. And again, if you've heard the show before, you know how much I really love Kev Walker, most recently on the Predator series. Um, and, you know, he's he's great. He was great at this. Uh, British artist, uh, cartoony, great at action, great at character acting, um, really lovely. But I kind of forgot about that as I started reading it. You know, I, I came for the Kev Walker, and once I got into the groove of it, I kind of didn't really notice it anymore. There's one thing that I, there's two things that I wanted to point out that were great. There is, if you're reading this uh, digitally, page 18, uh, Drax shows up and he shows a, a feat of strength by lifting a big heavy thing up uh, to save people. And they, they draw him um, in full on sort of like, like Conan Hulk muscly uh, glory. But as he does it, the lettering behind him, which is drawn, uh, as part of drawn on the board is drawn as part of the art. It says Drax sort of behind him. And I just, I was like, Oh, that's, that's, that's good old comic book, uh, storytelling page design kind of thing. And I really love that. And I, this is kind of like the dumb little thing that I love about comics, but you don't see modern comic book artists do that a lot. You don't see them put sound effects or let it, this wasn't even a sound effect. It was just like an introduction thing. And it was kind of cool. They didn't do it anywhere else in the book. Uh, but they did it here. And the other thing I liked is that in the story uh, by by Misters Kelly and Lansing, um, basically they have like two train cars of refugees that they have to take care of, and some shit goes wrong, and one of the train cars is lost, and the and the guardians are like, "Now, nah, well, we did it. We did. We got one. You know, that was probably the best we could have even hoped for." Um, oddly enough, I think uh, who was on it? I think Gam- no. One of the people, Mantis was still on the one that fell, and she says we're okay, but then the the Groot hits, and apparently the world has been scoured, so I don't know, was Mantis killed in this? I guess it's possible. Good start. Very good start. It's very back to roots. Like I said, it, it's totally played like a Western. They have hats and, you know, jackets and scarves, and, and they're in the desert, uh, like every Star Wars television program. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but, but, you know, it there's something going on, but the gang is back together. They are recognizable enough from the movie, but are still the comic book versions of them a little bit. Uh, Peter Quill is not being played like Chris Pratt so much here, um, unless, I guess, is if Chris Pratt had really gone through some shit. But even though Chris Pratt survived uh, several dinosaur island infestations, he's still kind of wacky, and this Peter Quill isn't. So maybe I'm wrong about that. Let's get over to, oh God, I was so prepared to say this was the finale of 8 Billion Genies, but now that I'm I'm saying it out loud, uh, I'm not sure. But 8 Billion Genies, number eight, uh, and this represents uh, like a, a jump forward in time as we learn a lot about the genies. And we, we, we jump forward and we sort of see where they came, we don't jump forward, we jump backwards and then move forward. It's the last 800 years. So it's sort of the beginning of genies on earth and how uh, some of this stuff came to be, including the bar owner um, at the beginning of of the story who has that bar and, and his wish is that um, nothing that happens outside affects the inside of the bar. And, and, it, and we learned, I think in last year, that he was a genie. And so we learn his story, and he's been on Earth for a while. Not unlike, you ready to get comic book deep on this? This would have been a lot deeper before the Sandman TV show. But Hob Gadling, you know, he lived through all of history, basically. Lived through 800 years of history, learning about humans, spent some time at the beginning, you know, uh, screwing around, uh, fulfilling his earthly urges urges and whatnot. Um, He just can't die. That was kind of the only thing about him. And uh, and then he ends up in this bar because he's had enough of everything. You know, I've liked everything about this damn series. I <laughs> just like, and then it sort of later, 
uh, we go 800 years later. So we have the 800 years before, and then the 800 years later. I knew I got it right eventually. Um, if you <laughs> can, if you listen to the show normally, you'll have, you have Connor here to correct me constantly because uh, I don't pay attention to stuff. Uh, and we see. I've lost track of the characters, but like the one, the one uh, woman comes back to the bar. I think she might be the one who was the the bass player in the band at the beginning who wasted her wish, and sort of you see what's happened to them. And and I guess the world's world's been fixed. She just wishes for love, and then everything starts over. This is the end, according to the last page here that says the end. And I don't think there's much else you could do with it. Fun, incredibly original. Uh, a comic book series of eight issues from Charles Soule and Ryan Brown. Um, they've done other projects together before. I cannot tell you of another comic book or movie or anything that this was like. The sort of, the way that the genies were conceived and drawn and played worked. You're like, oh, okay, yeah, they're genies. I get it. But it was a, to me, a completely original rendering of that idea and everything that happened around it. Um, it's so weird, man, because Charles Soule is, a, is, I don't mean to keep doing this, but it's true. And it's its part of my understanding of it. Charles Soule's a guy I have known for a long time. I met him at my fanboy party years ago. I mean, I don't even know, seven, 2007, maybe. And he had just done this book, 27, um, which was a really original idea. Again, well, it was about the 27 Club where the rock stars die and then there was a deal with the devil, blah, 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 whatever. I really liked the book. You know, I, I remember before he sort of, he got the chance to talk to DC for the first time. And then he went through that and he did all the DC stuff. And then he went over to Marvel and he did the death of Wolverine. And now he's writing books and he's kind of writing all the Star Wars comic books. And it is amazing that in the midst of that, he goes and he does this series. And he's got another series over at uh, Image, which I didn't love so much, but it doesn't matter because... You know, he's doing all of these things. This guy was an attorney. <laughs> you know, like, uh, it's so impressive. Um, and then, like, you, he can surprise you out of nowhere with this kind of series that I can't even describe to you. I couldn't tell you what it is. Um, and I think that, by the way, in, in this instance, like with the, the, I forget what it's called, but the wizard book that he did with Ryan Brown before, I think the two of them created a thing together. I don't mean to just give it to Charles Soule, but that's what we do when we see writers' names on comic books sometime. Either way, it's a it's a it's a thing, you know, that that did did not exist. Like it's a new original idea, and that is so valuable when you read two dozen comic books a week for eighteen years or what what year is it? Seventeen years, something like a lot of years is what I'm saying. Older than I have I didn't have children when I started this. Couldn't imagine having children when I started this. And now, I mean, we're very close to one of them having wisps on his his lip. You know, although he's my kid, so it'll be another fifteen years before that happens. Uh I was able to grow a beard when I was thirty one, finally. It was thin, but it's coming in now. It's coming in, buddy. Let us now take one brief moment to talk about how you out there with the ears can help me. That's right. Here comes the begging and pandering section. <laughs> if you like this show, uh, this is what you got this week. And I, I, I don't know to apologize. I don't know to wait for praise and thanks. But here we are. You can go to patreon.com slash ifanboy. Big deal. This, the Patreon thing. This keeps the show going. Uh, if you sign up for Patreon, we try to make it worth your while with content and entertaining uh, shows and things like that. Uh, my erstwhile partner, again, I believe I said erstwhile previously, he he keeps those trains running. If it was just me, this wouldn't work. Ironically, I'm doing the show by myself, but still, in the larger sense. Um, Patreon's Patreon and the patrons get this all going. You directly support the show. You've unlocked shows that will apparently continue indefinitely for the rest of my life. Josh, why isn't there a talk explode? I don't know, but I'm not allowed to ever stop from what I can tell. Actually, I totally know why. Uh, they unlock shows for everybody. You're a part of a great community. Uh, iFanboy's been such a part of my life for a long time. And uh, man, uh, the patrons may not know exactly how much they've helped me out of jams, uh, but, it, but it made a big difference. And that's why I will never be able to stop doing this. And it's why I sit here, but right now, in my room, by myself, talking to people, which is really weird. I just want to make that. It's super weird 
to do this. And I know people do, but I usually I get to play off somebody. Um, this, anyways, I found what I throw this dot com. There are twelve designs that are on t shirts and more. Uh, a very a very kind patron uh, sent me uh, a skateboard with one of our designs on it that I would not have bought for myself and. Man, you are some nice people out there. And I'm looking at that skateboard right now with my Clint is dead, uh, which resembles, but is not in any way associated with Marvel's Hawkeye. It resembles it. Um, so there's really cool stuff at ifanbartothreadless.com. There is ifanbart.com slash support. There's a direct donation to PayPal link. If that's if you'd like to help out with the show, but you don't want to deal with any of the other stuff, that's a way to do it. There is ifanbart.com slash Amazon. You'll find links to buy the books that we talk about on Book Explodes. You will always find a link to the music we use uh, and the pick of the week. Uh, and also, this is just a general link uh, to to buy things that you need from the giant Earth devouring superstore, uh, where the trucks where the trucks are everywhere. The trucks are ubiquitous now. You know when they they were like, "Nah, we can do mail on our own. That'll be fine." They do that now, and the people come to the house, and they take a picture of the thing they leave on your front step, and that's a little weird, but we all got used to it is what I'm saying. Finally, is bookshop.org. That is a way to help local bookstores. It, it aggregates the local bookstores so that you can order it on the internet like you would anything, but it actually helps people who do something good, like run local bookstores. You'll find links where those are appropriate. And with that done, we are back to more comics. I promised myself that I would pay attention to my rate of speaking. Last time I did this, I like I I think I wore out my throat because I just talked constantly. I talked really fast. I forgot to take a drink, so I had to cut all these coughs in the middle of it. So let's try. I was like, well, I have to talk really fast so that I can get to my thoughts, and and then I don't have any silence and it bores people. But I'm I'm gonna try to meter it. I'm gonna try to take it easy. Um, this is this is still. I've done this. I don't know three, four, five times, something like that. It still feels like uncharted territory. It feels like teetering on the edge of a very nerdy high wire. Uh, and at any point, uh, it could be terrible. But I have gotten good feedback, so I'm going to assume I'm not terrible at this. Uh, but I guess that's up to you, ultimately. You know, a long time ago, I got an email from somebody. This was like, I want to say two or three years into doing the podcast. And we were, you know, we were fairly popular early enough on. And and somebody, I want to say it was a girl, but I'm not sure, wrote a very long email about how we were very good at this. But I, Josh, need to stop saying um so much. And then there was a great deal of explanations. And and I, you know, I didn't I didn't stop saying um, as you can tell. Uh, um, uh, that's how people talk. And I have to think about things when I say them. And sometimes that's the sound I make. And I didn't stop. However, every single time I catch myself, dude, I think about that email. And I don't know why that is. Like, have you ever had, if somebody gives you a compliment about something, uh, I had a girlfriend in college and she said, well, when you play guitar, you sound like Eric Clapton. Now, there's a lot wrong with that. I don't, but I remember it. And I think, what a nice thing to say. I think about it all the time. But I also think about the person who said, you shouldn't say um so much. I don't remember who, who it was. I remember it was a very long email. They said, don't say ah uh, um so much. And I, I think about it all the time. And sometimes I just do it out of spite. Like now. No. Uh, nope, there it was. See? And I thought about it. That's the thing that's going through my mind almost all the time that I do this, especially when I'm by myself. Fantastic Four, number six, continues to be, wait for it, fantastic. This is the gang is back together. The, the the four of the family. And I I feel like I forgot what happened in the last one, but we are left with the thing where there is an alien microbiome bacterial something or other that is threatening to take over the entire Earth. And what they are trying to do is clear out lakes where this thing is repli- is replicating itself. I think some of some of the space space bacteria had gotten stuck on Ben Grimm. And now it's threatening to take over the Earth. And they try to sort of take it out a lake at a time. And we get sort of big science action super stuff. It's not going to work. And so they come up with a plan and and uh, of some hubris to block out the sun from one place where the bacteria is so it cannot grow. And kind of the thing that's interesting about this is uh, the, up in space, you get Johnny and Sue. And they have a nice little sibling time. It's actually very sweet. And then everybody else down on Earth is trying to 
uh, keep crowd control and keep keep people be like, no, no, we're we're trying to help. And then uh, Maria Hill shows up. Is it Maria Hill? Yeah. And she is mad because they blocked out the sun to part of the earth and didn't sell anybody. And you're not supposed to do that. Uh, and, then, and then the Fantastic Four freak out and leave. Man, Ryan Brown. I did not write the right, uh, um, uh, uh, whatchamacallit. I did not write the right credits for this one on the script. So uh, I just called him Ryan Brown. What a monster I am. No, 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 no. Ryan North who I just did a talk split with, uh, has just really made a beautiful series out of this. And we've talked about it before. This story is a single issue. If you have been like, I don't know if I haven't read the, the Fantastic Four yet, and you're not sure, you wanna, this single issue is exactly what it should be. Um, listen to my talk split with Ryan North. He's incredibly smart and also incredibly funny in almost equal measure and a, and, a, and a really committed storyteller. In fact, if you listen, we talk about sort of storytelling and he's broken down the elements of what makes a good story to something so simple that you would think, well, that can't work like that, but it has and it does. And, and he did it this way. This is a fantastic issue. This could have been pick of the week as well. Uh, Predator number two. I got worried. I can't believe I'm talking about a Predator comic like this. Still, I got worried after Kev Walker left the first series of the books and then he went over to that Guardians of the Galaxy. And that makes total sense why he would go from Predator to Guardians of the Galaxy. I get that from a from a profile standpoint. That they would replace uh, uh, Kev Walker with this artist. And it would, it would I wouldn't like it as much. Because I liked it. It was odd how much I liked it. Uh, and, then, and then Connor read it. He's like, yes, this is good. Which usually is a good indication if both my co-host and myself agree separately that wow something is sort of strangely good it's usually pretty good i've been doing this a while i know how it works anyway this story this second arc uh it, it has the character from the first arc uh the lady who kills predators because they killed her parents but it's a planet where they've taken a bunch of people from out time and history uh, to practice hunting. And the predators are there, and it's like a little little game preserve they have there. But all the people are from different times, and they're like, do they have time travel? Do they have this? No. It, they Apparently, they freeze folk uh, it, so that they can hunt them together, different or whatever. And then it's just really smart. And it's... it's I, 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 like Keeping track of all the characters is not great, but then there's one guy, and he's a little different than everybody because they're soldiers, mostly. And then there's just one guy who's kind of a tough guy. I think he's like a bouncer or something like that. It's really interesting, and it's it's totally unrelated to what had happened before, and it just it just goes to show. In Predator is a dumb, or at least a thin concept in movie form. This alien thing likes to hunt. You know, we don't know anything about them, but they're scary. Now that's enough. You can hang a movie on that or do whatever. But I think that the book does this really cool thing where. It doesn't really tell you too much about these characters, but it gives you enough to hang on to so that there is some actual mystery. It's not just a scary thing in the forest. But you also don't want to know too much. Like, if you explain the Predator too much, it, it, it ain't going to support that weight, is what I'm saying. And from the good folks at Boom Studios, we have Know Your Station number five. We have been talking about this... I don't know that we've talked about every issue. we talked about two or three of them. Uh, this... Uh, story from Boom Studios written by Sarah Gailey with uh, illustrations by Liana Kangas and colors by Rebecca Nalty with letters by Cardinal Ray uh, is the weirdest little space station class warfare AI mystery that I have seen in some time and I, I, I really like the pitch and I liked that it followed through on the thing, but then at the same time, the book that we ended up with was so unique and different than what I expected to be, but without going off the rails. And I don't want to give away this because I expect that most people who are listening to this haven't read it. Most of you won't, but a few of you might. And I just want, and if you do read it, then you're going to know exactly what I'm talking about. The ending of this book was some fucked up shit. It was entirely unexpected it wrapped up in a way i would have never i I can't even if you've read it you know what i'm talking about it's some fucked up shit it's dark it's gory and it's it's oddly it's it's like it's like if mark russell 
was extra fucked up is kind of what's going on and it, i was really i was really impressed by the ending uh from 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 boom the story it's just I, you have to say boom like that because it has an exclamation point on it that's trademark then we have teenage mutant ninja turtles usagi yojimbo where when number one where when number one so what is this you say well it starts off as just a regular usagi yojimbo story where is this we're over at idw i don't remember what idw stands for Something works. I don't know, does anybody remember that off the top of their head? I don't know that I do. IDW Publishing, whatever. Uh, Isagi Ojimbo was was being was being published like regularly uh, from IDW. There was new stuff, and then there was colorized old stuff that was coming out. And so, like twice a month, I got new uh, new Isagi Ojimbo, and it was the best thing in the world. So what we have here is Stan Sakai doing all of the stuff except coloring. Coloring is by Hi Fi Design which I don't believe is uh, what Hi-Fi Design's mother named Hi-Fi Design, but we'll never know. Maybe that is the name. Anyway, uh, Stan Sakai, it's new, uh, is doing a uh, Ninja Turtles and Usagi Ojimbo crossover, I guess, and I'm fine with that because he's writing and drawing the whole thing. Do whatever he wants. Um, I, I, I don't know. Uh, it was people of all sort of ages. Teenage Ninja Turtles. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. <laughs> <laughs> Try saying that fast. It doesn't work. That tells you I'm moving too fast. Uh, it was one of the last sort of child properties, I think, of my childhood that I connected with. Um, and and I like it, but I don't like it. I don't like read the books or anything. I have no problem with it, but it doesn't really hold me anymore. However, when you have a master cartoonist here, and and obviously the first time I ever heard of Yusaki Ojimbo was when they released a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Wow. <laughs> On the Conan O'Brien podcast, they always made fun of him because he, he'd say... He he wouldn't say Saturday Night Live. He'd say Saturday Night Live, Saturday Night Live, and that's what I'm doing with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So I'm just gonna say Ninja Turtles because I can't do it. Anyway, uh, they released a f- action figure of Usagi Ojimbo, and that was the first time that I ever heard of that. And I didn't know it was a comic, just the same way that when I first heard of Ninja Turtles, I didn't know it was a comic, but it was. It was a great comic. Uh, anyway, half of this is just a new Usagi story. Uh, there's a war, uh, some people need help. They said, hey, we, we don't have time to help you. And then they go and help them anyway. Halfway through, we find the turtles, uh, again, all drawn by uh, Stan Sakai. And uh, they, they're fighting something. I don't know. There's a time travel thing. It's called Where When. And they're going to end up in the same place. And that doesn't happen in this issue. So we'll find out how they interact. Well, they, they do interact, but we don't know why or what's going on. And they haven't made friends yet. Because when two heroes meet and they don't know each other, they fight. It's just how it works. That's the rule. And so, um, you know, (laughs) this would have to be so terrible for me to not want to read a new uh, Stan Sakai, Usagi Ojimbo. This crossover could have been with anyone. This could have been a Scooby-Doo crossover. It could have been uh, the cast of Too Close for Comfort. This could have been, uh, you know, Kiss or Nickelback meet Usagi Ojimbo, and I would read the thing. It doesn't matter. I will do it. I am so hard up for new or reprinted Usagi Ojimbo that I'd take anything. And by the way, I know that there's collections out there. I would love getting one single issue of it at a time. And and it's unrealistic for me to think that this is going to go on forever. Uh, but I, I just, it makes me so happy. So uh, this is worth reading, is my point. Uh, if you like the Ninja Turtles, maybe that'll be good for you. But if you like Usagi and Stan Sakai, uh, it's definitely worth it. You should check it out. I'm going to be going through that whole darn series maybe twice. You know, one of the things about being a patron, which you can find at patreon.com slash iFanboy, is that uh, everybody, everybody gets to vote on the book that they would like us, me, to talk about. And this week... The patron pick was The Great British Bump Off, number one, uh, from Dark Horse Comics, with script by John Allison, art by Max Saren, colors by Sammy Boris, and letters by Jim Campbell. Now, I saw this on the list, and I thought, all right, it's a new number one. I don't think I'm going to read it. I've never watched one of those British baking shows. That's what I thought. And then... I downloaded it anyway because I was like, I have the pick. I got to see I gotta see what it is. And then Connor was like, it's probably going to be the patron pick because he, he follows these things. I, you, by the way, you guys, you got to understand what an amazing amount of work Connor does uh, for you. 
it's or for him. He's one of us, not for me. But uh, the 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 way that he does the pick of the or the patron picks and the math on it and all this stuff, it's incredibly complicated. And I was ready to stab my own eyes out as I did it in his absence. But uh, you should appreciate it, is what I'm saying, because it doesn't not take time. It takes a great deal of time. Anyway. So I didn't watch the shows, uh, I didn't do whatever, and I don't know any of the creators here, but I decided I would read it anyway, and also as a patron pick, so I had to. And what we have is we're on the set of a TV show, uh, one of those British baking shows, and someone is murdered. There's a fight that happens, and then they come back in, and everybody walks off to cool off, and they come back in, and the jerky guy from the fight is dead. Everybody thinks, oh man, I'm gonna, we're gonna lose our, we, we just, we waited so long to get on this show, and, and, and then so the plucky little, little, uh, plucky woman who is the, uh, so I guess the protagonist of this, approaches the producers and says, wait, don't cancel the show, I will solve this murder while we do the show, and then everything will be fine. And the book is very light-toned, it's, uh, it's satire, it's not dry humor, it uh, reminds me. This is going to be a terrible. This is going to be a terrible uh, uh, comparison because nobody read. But there was a book from IDW called True Cult recently, and there was a there was a girl on there, and she was applying to work at a fast food place, and she just talked and talked and talked, and was uh, you'll recognize this character is what I'm saying, probably from you know Lego movies or whatever whatever is going on. But it's it's a overly in her head sort of funny but not sure about herself, but very capable character. And she's going to try to solve the mur- the murder. I think I know who the murderer is, but that could be a red herring. Uh, it was fun. It's very uh, cartoony. It's very lighthearted. It looks, you know, you could see the, the, the this acting and the faces and the characters on, you know, in an animation of some kind. Um, I, I, I <laughs> enjoyed it despite myself. If that makes sense, I didn't really expect to like it. If you if you told me about it, or even gave me a few pages on their own, I'd be like, yeah, that's not really my thing. And I'll tell you, it's not really my thing. But I think it was well done. I enjoyed it. I'm going to read it. I want to know what comes next. It isn't going to make me watch British show, uh, break, baking shows. I watch British shows. I'm not going to say it turns me off from all of the television programs of the United Kingdom and, and the related areas. If there was a very good show from the Isle of Man, I'd watch it. I've got no problem with that. Uh, it's it's the baking. It's the I don't watch any reality shows except for ironically Top Chef. Uh, but every time someone tries to bake on Top Chef, they get kicked off. It's just it's just how it works. That's literally the only reality show I watch, and I've been watching it for like twenty seasons now. So uh, th- there you go. But I, I enjoyed this, um, and it's kind of a fun lighthearted murder mystery uh it's not quite a locked box but it's it's kind of like that it's uh you know little knives out but mixed uh with with this other stuff um but p- pretty light not not super uh um heavy or anything like that in fact they they take murder quite lightly they would definitely cancel this show you wouldn't be able to shoot after they found a dead body on set but you know producers those are bastards all right, so it's two things. I already said I was sticking with it. You already heard me, so that's a spoiler. Ratings. The ratings. What am I going to give this book? I think I think that they accomplished their intention very well. And if it was, you know, if you were to say, like, did our execution come through? I say yes. It's, 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 a, it's a, almost a five, four and a half on that. Me, personally, if I have to give you my subjective opinion, by the way, only kind of opinion. No, that's not true. I think I have objective opinions. But for this, one to five, uh, I got a vamp on my own while I try to think of what my number is. 3.6. 3.6, which is pretty high because I didn't want to read it. (laughs) So, and I am going to, I'm going to read it. So I think it's worth it. If you were curious about it, I think it's, it's, it's worth your time. And then you can decide, you, I think you decide very quickly reading this, whether you're going to like it or not, or you want to keep going. So. There you have it. Did you know that if you are a patron, and if you're listening to me, I don't know what the percentage is, but you're probably not. But if you're listening to me and you are a patron, thank you. Uh, everybody who gives it a $5 or higher level is afforded, is bestowed a patron power. A, a, a superpower, a, a supernatural or, or, 
or uh, uh, hey, a thing that people can't do most of the time. Most of the time. You never know. One of these could be real. We give a power out. And this week, Pat George, he or she or they of the indeterminate first name and double first name, full name, Pat George, uh, has the power to change any candy or snack food to a different variety of that specific candy or snack food. Allow me to explain. Have you ever had an Oreo? Of course you've had an Oreo. They're delicious. Have you had a double stuff Oreo? You have. Have you had a mint Oreo? If you haven't, you should have. I'm saying you can't get mint. You can't get thin mints all the year. But if you if you can find a steady supply of those mint Oreos, <laughs> brother, you got yourself something special. Or sister. I don't care. Pat George doesn't care. Whatever is Whatever you want to be, that's good for me. I will help you with those things. I accept you. The point is... There's other kinds of Oreos out there. So what happens if you go to the store and you want a mint Oreo, but you can't get those, and they only have uh, red velvet Oreos, or they only have toffee Oreos, which, by the way, would be disgusting. Pat George can change that to another variety of Oreos. Any kind that they want, that exists. They're not making up new ones. You can't, he's not going to do salmon Oreos. That's terrible. But uh, another example. I, you know what we're we're doing snack examples. Another example is that uh, you're you're from you're listening. You're familiar with uh, Twix. You're familiar with Twix, yes? It's the it's the Cookie Crunch. Uh, George Costanza loses his his Twix, the last Twix in the machine, to the uh, the mechanic at the car at Putty's car dealership. That's right. I can refer to Seinfeld at any time without warning. So the regular Twix is the cookie in the middle. Sort of a, it's a, a, a white, uh, white, a light colored cookie, not a chocolate cookie. There's caramel, there's chocolate covering it. For a, for a not inconsiderable amount of time, there were peanut butter Twix. The peanut butter Twix substituted peanut butter for the caramel and then also took the cookie and made it into a dark chocolate. I fucking love peanut butter Twix. And you know that they do not exist in the Northeast, at least, anymore. They do not exist. There's other varieties of them. Uh, regular Twix are obviously still available in ever-enlarging packages. You used to be able to buy two, and now I think the minimum is 12. I think to get, you have to buy the super king-size sharing. Nobody's sharing shit. Anyway, I want peanut butter Twix, and I think Pat George is the way to get me there. And I, it's a fine, there's, there's all sorts of ways that you could look at this. There's many varieties of snack cakes, and they disappear over the years. Pat George doesn't have to worry about that. Finds your favorites. If you want a superpower uh, bestowed upon you, you can go to patreon.com slash ifanboy, and of course, give it the $5 higher level, and it will be yours eventually. I have left time. I can't believe we're this far in. This is, it, you guys. I think this is going pretty smoothly. Although I will say, I think that my comic book analysis is slightly lacking. Uh, without the ability to play off somebody, I don't think I have as good ideas because I'm having to fill everything. I was diagnosed with ADHD recently. I know, it's surprising that you're listening to me after all this time. You, Josh? You? It's true. Uh, <laughs> diverticulitis and ADHD. It's been a hell of a week, people. Uh, Jonathan <laughs> says... On the Kingdom Come Booksplode, Josh, that's me, mentioned that he enjoyed Cavalier and Clay a lot more knowing the history of Golden Age comics. Where would one start to learn about the history of Golden Age comics so that I can also enhance my enjoyment of Cavalier and Clay? It should be noted that uh, the letter writer has started both of those names with a C, whereas really only Clay starts with a C, and the titular character of Joe Cavalier or Josef Cavalier uh, is with a K. That's not here or there, and it was it was kind of petty for me even pointed out if I'm if I'm if I'm going to be truthful with myself. Um, so I guess we've talked about this before. You know, all the stuff I know about uh, Golden Age comics mostly comes from the same stuff as reading about Jack Kirby. So there's Tales to Astonish by Ronan Rowe, or they sort of talk about him coming up. There was um, Marvel: The Untold Story by Sean Howe. Uh, talked a lot at the beginning. Uh, period of comics uh, with you know timely comics and Martin Goodman who was Stan Lee's cousin and brought Stan in and and they did stuff and there was uh, Victor Fox uh, who ran one of the sort of more notorious studios uh, I've read Joe Simon uh, did an autobiography 
um, that talks about that time in great detail. Um, there's a King Kirby book, which is mostly a picture book, but is also somewhat biographical uh, by Mark Evanier, who was who's a writer and cartoonist. I don't think he's a cartoonist, writer in his own right, but uh, was Kirby's assistant. I guess he would make him an artist probably uh, way back when um, he's sort of the guy who carries the torch for Kirby or, or was at least before the sort of Kirby family sort of got back into things. Uh, those are some good places to start. And, and, and the, the Cavalier and Clay exists in the world, uh, in our world to a certain extent. So Stan Lee exists there. Martin Goodman, Timely Comics exists there. Uh, National Comics, which is DC, exists there. Um those will get you. Those will get you some of the way there. There, there might be others over time. Uh, the Ten Cent Plague. Uh, it was just a book about um, Wortham. Uh, is also in there, but also just years of talking about the stuff and reading about the stuff. Uh, I know. I know more about it now. I guess, and so does Connor. Uh, but those are really good places to start to sort of give you an idea. I think uh, Tales of Astonished by Ronan Rowe is not available. Uh, in print anymore but if you can find it i really love that book that was my sort of intro to all this stuff oh and then there was the the recent uh stanley book which uh i can't remember the name of right now uh but but that was in there uh and then um tom spurgeon and another person did another stanley book uh that i read a, a while back before he he had passed away um that'll that'll get you all in the ballpark um i think it's a fascinating time to sort of see where comics and eventually superhero comics comes from it's you know it's mostly new york it's mostly uh jewish people it's mostly poor jewish people um m- you know creating this art form and this this media and sort of taking everything over and of course somebody came along and and tried to ruin it and dr frederick wortham and uh it changed things but uh they stuck around and we still got jack kirby out of it that's a good place to start mike from buffalo says do you think that the big two both need a sort of come to Jesus moment like they had in the late 90s? Not a reboot or they get rid of everything, but scraping away all the junk and getting back to the core and roots of their characters like Heroes Return at Marvel, which is the the Busick part. I'm sorry, the Busick Perez Avengers, Wade and Garney, Kubert on Cap. Jurgens and J.R.J.R. on Thor and Marvel Knights and the original universe era at DC, Rucka and Brubaker on Bat Books, Jeff Johns on The Flash, and JSA, and and the main seven as their focus of the JLA under Morrison. That's the end of this mail. Um, those things are brought on by economic forces, Mike from Buffalo. Um, and I think that at, at current time, the economic forces do not exist to force that. Uh, where we're talking about the late 90s, we're talking about a, a massive economic collapse following uh, the age of speculation and the, the boom, as they call it, where everybody's making money hand over fist and they were selling um, books based on speculation. They'd sell you know, 3 million copies of something because everybody went out and bought them and thought that they would make money from them and blah, blah, blah. And it sort of spiraled out of control. And... And then Marvel went into bankruptcy and a lot of comic shops went out of business. And so they were like, well, how can we get, you know, people to read comics again? And it wasn't like a one, there wasn't a meeting. There wasn't a, there wasn't like a, just stuff, stuff contracted. And it it seemed like as they came out of it, they were like, let's get to the thing that we do. Um, And I don't believe that those economic circumstances exist because I mean, on the one hand, these comic, like, like superheroes pretty much only existed in comic book form. There was an animated series here and there, and a, you know, a TV show, or whatever it was. But the main knowledge of the of the superhero in the public was that it was something that existed in the comic book form. And of course, since then, we have seen the global explosion of superheroes as a an entertainment genre, mostly in uh, film and television. And those revenue streams, even like we make jokes, we'll say, you know, DC Comics can't get together. They make money. They make money from those movies and they make more from those movies than they do from comics, period. And at this point, you know, comics serve as an ancillary revenue stream and a source of IP. And that ain't... The corporate masters don't want to fix it because they don't see anything that needs to be fixed as long as the movies are selling. Now, eventually when all this falls apart in some way and then comics 
comics, the, the greater comics, capital C, is left holding the bag with all these characters and stuff like that. And the public doesn't want them anymore. And making the movies doesn't make any sense. Any, making the movies like that doesn't make any sense anymore. Then you might see something happen. You might see budgets constrict and comic shops go away or whatever the means of distribution is. You will, you could see, you will. I don't know what's going to happen. A lot would have to happen for them to change the way that they're doing things. They're trying new things constantly. And that sounds good, and sometimes it is, and sometimes it's not. Um, but it's still f- – comics, you know, in the time that I've been doing the show or, or my website or whatever, comics is always, to a certain extent, fed from the trough of Hollywood. Uh, subsidized largely – independent comics were certainly subsidized largely by people trying to figure out a way to make the next big thing in terms of a movie. And then in 2008, you know, Marvel Studios uh, erupted – uh, like Zeus, uh, and 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 sort of took over Hollywood and has done since then. It's that that boat does not need rocking. There's there's nothing that needs to happen uh, to change how they're doing things, unless something starts going wrong. And I think it'll be a long time. Listen, superheroes are going to become less popular. The fact that is this is now as long as it has is amazing, but it will slow down and eventually it will not be a thing just like westerns are not really a thing in movies you see them sometimes in their shows then the other thing of course that is going on is that we live in a very different world than we did back then media is so split you can pick and choose and take anything you want there are streaming services and television networks and there are so many things to watch and read and consume and whatever and the the fact is it is the you know the long tail theory or whatever what you want you can get so they don't have to pull comic books into one small we don't have we got we got to fix how super they can they they want to do everything for everyone all the time and that does leave you feeling a little like you're not getting something special except though sometimes those special things still exist you can you can find what you want you just have to look really hard for it or maybe not but a monolithic sort of changing and shrinking of comic books i do not believe is in the cards anytime soon uh they're rolling you know in the way but they're not rolling the same way they used to um so i know i don't think that's going to be a thing we got our little i was going to say golden age but i talked about that before but we you know we had that 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 time that res renaissance which uh which they're talking about you know marvel knights and everything happened i don't think it happens again uh yeah i, I doubt it I think it'd be another 20 or 30 years before you see something like that. And if, if they're still making superhero comics at that point, God bless them. If you like, uh, if you like listening to letters and you think I can, I can, I can send a letter, I can string, uh, word, uh, letter characters together into words and then sentences and and that represent a thought that I've had that I would like these these gentlemen or just this gentleman to comment on. You can do so by sending an electronic mail to contact at ifanboy.com. You could also send one to our, our little sister show, our little side project, uh, Media Explode, where we talk about non-comics types of media. You want to put Media Explode in that subject line if you have a question for that. And we did it. We got through it, guys. Girls. Guys is the non non gendered guys. I I feel like, listen. I feel like I'm walking on eggshells here. But how uh, stereotypical is it to be a middle aged white guy being like, I don't know what to say, how to not offend anybody. But I'm just gonna go ahead and say, you know, I'm not trying to offend everybody. You know, I'm I'm coming from a good place, and that's all that really matters right now. Uh, and then the rest of it's just a bad repetitive joke that also middle aged white guys do. That's the show. <laughs> we have several ancillary shows that are in existence for you um there was a show about batman the doom that came to gotham which was the animated thing connor and myself talked about kingdom come from mark wade and alex ross uh the sort of uh epochal seminal uh painted beauty of a book uh that connor and i talked about um there will be a media explode. I don't believe it was released, but I know that we recorded it, so that will come soon. I really am looking at a talk explode. Uh, I have seen there's some my 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 targets. There's been some travel, and the people are traveling. And when that happens, it is difficult to nail them down uh, as they get really busy. But uh, I'm working on it. I promise. There will at the end of the years be twelve shows that are either media explodes or talk explodes. Um, it's difficult to find the time to set those things up, if I'm being completely honest with you. But as I said, 
apparently I have ADHD, uh, maybe that contributes to it. I don't know. It's not an excuse, although I can get a note from my doctor. You can find our entire library of over 1,300 shows and counting, much more than that if you actually put everything together in aggregate. That is at ifanboy.com or wherever podcasts are subscribed to, downloaded, listened to. There's lots of ways to do that now. can't believe I've been doing this for so long. You can follow us at iFanboy Comics on Instagram to find out what the pick of the week is before the show comes out. And sometimes Connor's not here and it gets done a lot later. But it still happens, which is the point. And I don't want to hear about it, Connor. You tyrannical bastard. And you'll find the best of the week in panels uh, there. Sometimes you're not going to find it this week, I'll tell you that much. You can follow Connor and myself on Instagram at uh, C.S. Kilpatrick and J.A. Flanagan, respectively. You can subscribe to YouTube.com slash iFanboy, where you will find all of our old video shows. And, of course, we post this show there every week. If this is how you choose to consume it in your times of saying, no, thank you, I do not want a free trial of your thing, stop asking me. And then they ask you again, and then you have to skip the ads, and you can't, it just goes on forever. And is it really worth watching that clip from Seth Meyers? Usually, because he's very funny, but that's how YouTube works. You could uh, read us a, read us, write us a review, leave a star rating, uh, thumbs up, uh, something. If there's a, like, a YouTube has the thumbs up, you could do that there. Wherever it is, Spotify, eh, whatever you do. If there's podcasts there, that's how you listen to it. If it lets you say something or rate us or do that, do that. That's really good. Super helpful. <sighs> Thank you so much for listening. I, I I really hope that you enjoyed this and it was not torture for you. It went by extraordinarily fast. That's what I know. I'm hunching terribly right now. So much hunting. Hunting. Hunching. Oh, Josh, we'll see you next week. I won't do this again for HDR, I promise. Bye.